Go ahead. Sorry. Oh. Hello, uh, my name is Keita Bergman and I am from Nacka Gymnasium uh, and I have a question for Professor Feringa uh, regarding some real-life applications of your um, yes. moving little parts. Um, there, is, uh, there are large dry spells all over the world uh, where plants and crops really don't thrive since they dry out way too fast and some plants have this natural defense mechanism that is being a C4 or a CAM plant yeah. uh, where they absorb um, the uh, carbon dioxide from the outside without having to open their stomatas and risk losing water. And I was wondering if you could see any um, applications of uh, making, in a way, uh, synthetic um, uh, tr transport um, enzymes or transport proteins or anything um, for plants that aren't naturally C4? Yeah, now this is a very tough question because first of all, uh, in enzymes, you know, mentioned that as example, I w you better talk to Professor Arnold then because he is the expert in that field. I would not say I can do that. She can do that. I'm quite sure she can do that. <laughs> So you can modify those enzymes and so on, make them working for those kind of purposes. Uh, what we do is with respect to the applications of our technology, you have to realize we wanted to solve some fundamental problems, how you can make something that doesn't move, like this piece of plastic, this bottle, yeah, okay, that can move, that we can harness the principles of mother nature to make things moving at the nano scale. That is what I showed you. So yes, we have now the first moving things. And my colleagues in France, for instance, made a piece of plastic, yeah, Gisepon in Strasbourg, that when you shine light, it starts to contract and expand, contract, expand. Can you imagine? You have your plastic bag and it starts to do this. Now you might ask, what can you do with it? But once you have material that moves, you can think about valves in your heart or all kinds of applications. Now, we made, an, recently I had no time to discuss it, we made an artificial muscle. So tiny molecules, and millions of them, organized in water, and they work together to pick up a piece of paper. Now, you might say, that's not really an application yet, but think about soft robotics. We have to learn how to make grippers, you know, to can do that, and maybe they will be used in medicine in the future. Uh, we used Professor Yagi's Beautiful type materials, we modified a bit, you know, but this principle, you know, this very robust hollow frameworks where he absorbs water. We put motors in it, we published this a few weeks ago. And now, these frameworks, yeah, you can rotate the motors and you can imagine you can use them to pump something or separate maybe salt water. I don't know, we have to think about that, eh? the salt from the water. There are all kinds of things, once you are able to move something, I mentioned these windows, this is no kidding, they will not use our motors because they are too expensive, but once you know how to move something, you can make a window that cleans itself, I mentioned that. And this is now made in Quanzhou in China, based upon these liquid crystal, dynamic liquid crystal materials. So, it's difficult to predict where, where it will go, we, we know that we can move things. Yes. What, uh, what wavelengths of light, you said that the light stimulated the yeah. movement. What uh, wavelengths? Yeah, that's a very important question. We, uh, we normally uh, use light, say, from 365 to 400 nanometer or so. Mm -hmm. But for many applications, you would like to have a little bit longer wavelength. So what we do now, we take uh, advantage of inorganic chemistry, so metal complexes, and we shift the wavelength all the way through the visible spectrum. So we can cover... We have now motors that rotate with 800 nanometers and so. And... Uh, now, for biological application, you know, for these smart drugs and so, we have just succeeded last year in making antibiotics that we can switch with red light. And this is crucial. I had no time to discuss this, you know, because you don't want to use ultraviolet light because it's dangerous. Eh? But red light, you know, heat, Professor Mikkel mentioned eh? red light. Eh? You, can, you can use it and it goes very deep. Eh? A red laser goes straight through your fingers. Eh? But is the energy enough to treat The energy is fine. You can, you can use it, no problem. Oh. And it works. And now we can, for the first time, go from cells to animal studies and then maybe to the clinic. We work together with people in the hospital because red light can be used and it goes, can be used in the body. 
And this is, this is now the big, big step. So we are extremely excited about that. Thanks for that question. That's yeah, wonderful. Thank you. thank you very much for answering. Hi, my name is Yi Cheng, and um, I was wondering if I can ask two questions. Or is that uh, we're going to keep it to one right now, okay. and you can always come back if it looks like the line is going down, OK, if okay. you don't mind. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Professor Faringa as well. Um, is it possible to harness the energy like from the molecules movement to just to get energy? Yeah, that's, uh, that's of course, we talked a lot about energy here. And let me make it absolutely clear, my nanomotors are not going to solve the energy problem. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, we think about opportunities to make small devices where you could harness or store energy. Yeah? If you can make a polymer chain, you know, a long chain, like my colleagues did, and you can wind it, yeah? you can put in a lot of energy. Yeah? Professor Arnold was talking about these small molecules that can contain a lot of energy. So if you can harness that energy, you can make maybe micro devices or so yeah, for powering things. And that is what we try, uh, try to do. But uh, one nanomotor does not, it's only piconewtons in what you can get. But if you have millions of them together, yeah, that's why we can make a muscle. And this is what we try to do, more this kind of thing. Not large scale energy, that is beyond that. Then you have to go to this gentleman and uh, to other people. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, um, my name is Maya again, and I'm from Nesby Vidrigon School in Norway. Uh, and I have a question about uh, potential nano submarines. Uh, because you talked a lot about molecular motor motors and how you made things move and the plastic and things like that. But with submarines inside of humans, they have to have a goal, they have to go somewhere. Do you have the technology now to no. decide where they're supposed to move? Because you have movement, no. but can you control them? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is, of course, very tough because what you have to do is to put on something that recognizes, for instance, a tumor cell or so. And James Tour, uh, we, we are working on those kind of things, but many, many people around the world work, of course, on drug delivery and yeah? dr delivery of pharmaceuticals. This is a hot topic. I mean, there are fantastic groups around the world that work on that kind of problems. And, uh, and, and what you have to do is to find something not only to deliver, but also to recognize, for instance, a tumor cell. So we work together with people in the medical school to uh, look at, uh, for instance, antibodies that we modify and that they can detect tumor cell. But James Tour, for instance, in, in Rice University in Texas, he uh, made one of our motors, the second generation motor, and he put a, a ligand to it that can, uh, or, uh, and a drug, and he drills a hole through a membrane in a tumor cell, and he delivers a drug. At least he got some very uh, nice results. He published in Nature, I think, last year or so. So yeah, there are these kind of approaches, yes. Very interesting, thank you. Okay. Yes, hello, I'm Aada Payer from Åbo Academy University, Finland. And uh, thank you all for your interesting speeches today. And I also have a question for Professor uh, Feringa uh, regarding your switch-like molecule that you um, manufactured. So fluorescent, mo uh, fluorescent uh, molecules usually lose their fluorescent ability due to photo bleaching. Yes. So is this an issue also in your switch-like molecules? This is a fantastic question. We struggled with that for many years. And many people, of course, have this problem when they do all this beautiful imaging that you need fluorescent compounds that are stable enough that you don't immediately destroy. <coughs> we had this, uh, we wanted to make, I, once again, I couldn't show it, but, but a single motor rotating. And so you need a flu an arm and a fluorescent group. And then you can see the fluorescent group as a kind of small eh, lightning lamp, and you see it rotating. And we did it. But it took us several years to get the molecules because it was a very difficult synthesis and we had to put the molecule on the surface, long arm and a fluorescent group. And initially we were blowing away the fluorescent group. Yeah, it was indeed destroyed when we do the rotation. But ultimately we ma made it. And the motor rotates and the fluorescent group does it and we can see it. Yes, it's a really important problem when you make these kind of materials, that you make them robust enough, <coughs> and that, of course, the energy levels are fine and everything is stable. But we, we managed at the end, yes. But it, it was a key problem, and uh, it challenged our students for several years to get it all uh, worked out. But it was a nice adventure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have three 
excellent speakers here. So when you ask your question, perhaps you could think of some of your questions in a way that all could be involved. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Marwan. I'm from uh, Tali Gymnastic in Sudartelia. My question is linked to my previous, uh, to a question Professor Feringa answered, which is the control of the movement of the nanomolecules and particles. Uh, you said that they use, they feed off sugar and on the body, yeah. so yeah. they can move. Uh, they feed off sugar uh, on the body, so they can move. How to prevent, uh, if you want to deliver the medicine, how do we prevent it from moving to other directions? Oh. Yeah, but you know, we are far from that. What we wanted to do is just prove that you could move something with a f chemical fuel that is biological relevant, like sugar. You could you think of other fuels, yes? We have not done anything. You cannot go in a body or so, eh? You have to go to a... I mean, think about the development of new medicine. It takes many, many years to do all kinds of, of tests, etc., before you any can come close to a patient. Yes? So what we do is, we do in the laboratory, we want to show how you can do movement. With the ultimate goal might maybe be to do something in your body or so, but this is far from reality at this moment. This is a bit of a dream, of course, but you have to think about what would be relevant. If you only work out of water, you will never work in a biological system, for instance. Yeah? So here we were already happy that we could move something in water with sugar as the fuel. Okay. And we were very happy, I can tell you, that it worked. So the, the next steps is re real long, you know, it's a bit, bit still science fiction, yes. Okay. And long distance, yes. Thank you. But you have to dream a bit eh, about these things. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Agnes and I'm from Sultors Gymnasium. And I have a question for Rafael Damjan. Uh, I'm just wondering how fast a boat can go uh, that were driven by solar pa panels. So the speed of the boat, the average speed was about five knots day at night, so that was not really fast. Uh, our slogan on board, it was slow is beautiful. <laughs> but uh, actually at five knots, when you don't stop, uh, you can, it means that you do uh, uh, almost 200 kilometers per day. So when we cross the Pacific, for example, from the Galapagos to the French Polynesia, it was 6,000 kilometers that we did in 25 days. It was faster than the sailing boat who was behind us. Yeah. Excuse me, how much is five knots in kilometers per hour? 10 kilometers per <coughs> hour, the average kilometers. speed. And the maximum speed was about 10 knots, so 20 kilometers. That was the top speed. Yeah. Thank you so much. <coughs> Go ahead. Hi, my name is Ali from uh, Tabian Schiller Gymnasium, and I have a, pr a question for Professor Faringa. Uh, you mentioned the submarines, they uh, use sugar as fuel, and I was wondering if uh, you could use the, just the submarines to, so to say, uh, treat diabetes. I think it's type 1, because it kind of works the same as insulin, it lowers the blood sugar levels, or is that <laughs> not possible? Treat, treat diabetes or so. That was what? your question? Sorry, I didn't... Your question was if you could use these things to treat diabetes? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now, you have to be realistic, eh? We use... We got, I got the question, would it ever be possible to move something in your body, like a submarine, like this Asimov movie? So I discussed with the students, and I said, oh, this is a nice challenge. Can we make moving something in water yeah, with a fuel that would be relevant for the biological system. And so we decided to use sugar, two enzymes that can convert sugar in two steps, making oxygen and propel. And that was how far we got. Yeah? Now, how, why do I make this link to biological system? Because I got this question, would it ever be possible to do something like in this movie of Asimov? Of course, what we proved is that we could move something in water, as I said before. This is, of course, far from anything but diabetes or so, or whatever. Uh, but you could think about once you can use glucose and do something with it, like a catalytic conversion or movement or whatever, to think about making, making a sensor or so. But of course, there are other approaches for glucose sensors where they really can detect glucose, and several groups around the world work on that. But, uh, but it's, it's an important problem, of course. But here we were not really, 
I have to warn you, we were not really looking so much at applications or so. We want to prove fundamental principles of motion. Yeah? Now, with other things, we look at applications, like with these drugs, for instance. Yeah? We work together with people in the medical school. That's more realistic. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I think that we are um, all in agreement that one of the ways that we can improve energy efficiency is by using the sun much more than we have been. And Professor Mitchell, you were saying that you were a little bit um, concerned about the time frame for fission. So what would it take to speed up the process? What would be your hopes to make this happen in a little bit more conceivable time frame? What's missing is a material that is practical, that will actually survive on the roof for years. And uh, it has to have an efficiency that's close to 200% triplet yield. Otherwise, the gain is not worth the trouble, having two layers. And uh, as you have heard before, making predictions is not easy, particularly about the future. <laughs> and uh, it could happen tomorrow that somebody comes up with a system that's sturdy and practical, or it could take a year, or it could take five years. I, I do not know. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello. I have a question for Professor Mitchell about uh, other projects trying to break the limit of 32% efficiency in solar panels. Are there any other promising approaches? I'm, I'm, I could you quite... repeat the question, please? Are there any other promising approaches to break the 32% efficiency limit on solar panels? I see. Uh, if I understand correctly, you're asking whether there are other ways to overcome the shockley Weiser limit. Yeah. Yes. People work on other approaches too. For example, there are approaches that try to collect the low energy photons, combine two of them to make an excitation that's twice as big, and then use that to generate electron hole pairs. There are people who work on a hot electron idea, which would take the full energy of the photon that's absorbed. And before it uh, loses a good fraction by conversion into heat, inject an electron into the other, uh, across the junction. And uh, there are several others, people who work with nanoparticles trying to accomplish what we're trying to do with molecules. Uh, the, this is known as multiphonon, multiphonon generation. And um, uh, I would say that there are probably half a dozen approaches that people use. None of them have actually become practical. And uh, perhaps the probability that any one of them will succeed is only 10%. I, I don't know, it's hard to tell. But this problem is so important that I think it's essential to try to look under every stone on the beach, so to say. It, it's just uh, an essential issue. If uh, the, the way people, uh, the way people's DNA works is that a problem or a disaster that will happen at some time in the future basically doesn't exist. Only disasters that are at the door count. I see that twice a year when I teach students. I tell them in the beginning of the fall semester and the spring semester that there will be a final exam at the end of the semester. They ignore it completely. <laughs> Two days, three days before the final exam, then they start coming, asking questions, and become interested, because now the disaster is at the door. <laughs> so uh, mankind just has this built into its DNA. I think this is how you know, I was 
Of course, I was much better than today's students, but <laughs> um, I suffered from the same problem. It, it's just natural and human to worry about today's problem, not about a problem that will be serious 20 years from now or 30 years from now. And uh, I think we need to overcome this, and we probably won't. So the only solution, in my opinion, is to make sustainable energy actually economically competitive. If you can save money by using solar energy instead of burning coal, then people will do it. And this is why it's essential to improve the efficiency of solar cells. Because if you can do that by 50%, you're cutting back the cost of solar electricity that much. Okay. So okay. I think that's okay. absolutely there, essential. That's correct that we should work on costs, but if you think about it, maybe we have to change the way we view costs. Um, the, our resources are dwindling and there are different ways of evaluating uh, the wealth or merit of certain resources. So, for example, Raphael, you want to get to where we can use solar energy for boats and other forms of transportation. How do we do that? I mean, I am not fully agree with, with you. You are talking about efficiency. For me, the, the most important is the cost. Uh, if the efficiency is a little bit below, uh, we have enough place at the moment in the roof. Uh, almost 90% of the roof of this planet is empty of solar cells. The cost is the most important. And I think in the last two years, with the, the line cost, now, the, the, this energy, solar energy is the cheapest one in the world. And I think this is the most important now. It's, uh, uh, to the politic has to really to push this, this in advance these this technologies about mobility uh, what we show it 's demonstrate we want to make a demonstration of the power of solar energy. Uh, we are not thinking that uh, tomorrow the plane will be solar, but maybe the plane will be electric or using hydrogen, and somewhere we have a solar cells who will uh, uh, produce the energy for the plane, for the boat, for the car. I, we are not thinking about, about this. This is more for the, for the fun, to, to put a star in the eyes of the people. Okay. Can, can, I, can I be a student for a moment? Of course. Okay, then I'm allowed to ask a question to these gentlemen. I learned that solar cells are pretty good already and en getting energy. Yeah? The main problem is to store energy. So how are you doing this in your boat or in your plane? How to store energy, I, I learned that that is the key issue where we have the biggest challenges. But I would like to hear your comments on that, if I'm allowed. Eh? I'm, a stu I'm a student now. We're all students. Okay. <laughs> Professor first. <laughs> oh. uh, I mentioned uh, storage briefly, didn't go into any detail in 35 minutes. Uh, it is very important, people work on it. but. I don't think that that's really the only remaining problem in the utilization of solar energy. The um, uh, people work on uh, uh, liquid uh, cell uh, or batteries and uh, all kinds of things. Um, the, uh, the problem with, uh, the, with the current uh, situation, in my opinion, is that um, uh, oil, flows out of the earth uh, for free. You spend money, of course, looking for it. You spend money drilling and so on. But the people who have, or the countries that have a lot of oil, if they wished, could cut the price under anything that we can offer today with solar energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the proposal that was made by Laurie, and that is that we need to change the way people think of cost More uh, cost to in include, include the hidden costs that are uh, perhaps going to show up in uh, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, that, that's a very tough task. I think I'm afraid there you're fighting against human nature. For now, until it becomes like your final well, exam. That's right, yeah. But then it may be too late. You yeah. know, if we start saving... Uh, well, I think Raphael, who still will answer the question, I'm sure, but um, he's fighting to make us realize we should think about that now. 
And that's a very important thing to do. I, uh, I'm absolutely in favor of that. I'm just worried that it's not enough. I know, but we all have to try. That's, that's our message today, I guess. But Raphael, you want to? Well, I think it's a very good question. And uh, we come back to the costs. We know how to, uh, the storage of this type of energy, we know how to do it. Uh, there is, of course, the battery. It's quite expensive. And uh, I don't know in, in Sweden, but in Switzerland, for example, we have the hydraulic plant. Yeah, yeah. We can use it, we can, yeah. you know, the water. And now there is a lot of team who is working, for example, to s make a battery with the air uh, under uh, the water. It could be a lake, it could be the sea. So there is n some technology. The problem is when you add the cost of the energy and the storage, yeah. then the energy is too expensive if you compare with uh, fossil fuel energy, gas, yeah. and this type of things. Uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is clear, but it's again, it's the cost, the technology, we know how to do it. We have to change everything. For example, the, the grid, we have to adapt the grid with these new technologies, with, yeah. with, the, with the wind turbine. Uh, but I think the problem is not the technique. I think the problem is more that there is, in one hand, a big business. Of course, they have to change, and uh, they they don't want to stop. And I think it's uh, it's not a technique the problem. I think it's more the first of all. I think what you said that we will understand the problem when the problem will be at the door. I think this is one of the problem. It's changing. I think it's changing. And when you see the the young generation, they really understand that uh, we have to change now. But in your boat, you had also batteries too, for yeah. just in case. Yeah. Yeah. One megawatt hour. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then, in case it that was uh, possible to store for four days of uh, of energy in the, into the battery. Oh yeah. Otherwise, you got lost on the Pacific or so somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> just drifting. <laughs> not in the Bora Bora Island. <laughs> but usually, there is not not much uh, clouds yeah. there. Okay. Thank you so much, and uh, we can go back to the questions now. Go ahead. Um, hello, uh, my name is Johan Johannesson Lundqvist, and uh, I'm from Ecole Française de Stockholm. And uh, I have a question for Professor Michael, <coughs> Professor uh, Mikkel. Um, during your presentation, you talked about you, the usage of different types of uh, green power, such as uh, geothermal, solar, uh, etc. Uh, I was wondering about uh, what you thought about uh, uh, us, humankind, pursuing uh, different types of uh, nuclear reactors, such as the ones proposed by the um, uh, the Generation 4 International Forum, such as uh, VHTR or SFR, and etc., or Lifter. Um, I think the main problem with uh, uh, nuclear power today is uh, political. Mm -hmm. The uh, public has been sensitized by uh, Chernobyl and uh, Fukushima, and uh, uh, people are worried. Uh, if uh, the power plants, the nuclear power plants, could be built far away from where people live, they would not worry so much. Um, there are countries, you know, France is a nice example, that uh, have handled this and even the storage of the waste. Technically, I think it probably could be all handled. It's very expensive. That is, a, there is an issue. Um, and uh, the political pressure against it, you know, look at what happened in Germany when they decided to shut them down. Uh, it, that political pressure is, is large. Uh, there is almost also the issue of uh, possible uh, abused by terrorists, and uh, so, and the notion of you, know, you would run out of uranium in a, a relatively few centuries if you didn't use breeder reactors, and but the breeders are probably the most dangerous in terms of abuse. Yes, certainly. So it's um, it's a part of the equation, but I'm not sure that it will actually itself represent the solution. Well, uh, well I was mainly interested if you had any uh, specific opinions regarding the, uh, uh, the newer designs in the Generation 4s, for example. Uh, sorry. What? I, I, we can't understand. Could you get a uh, little Sorry. Um, I was more mainly interested in uh, what you thought regarding, what your thoughts were regarding the Generation 4 reactors, such as uh, 
I don't know, SFR or MSR, if you the have any clue. Generation four reactors. Ah, uh, well, again, uh, it, an advance, better than what one had before, but uh, the cost is still uh, almost prohibitive. Okay, thank you. It may be, you know, I mentioned fusion very, very briefly. That's something that most people dismiss as just very unlikely to happen. If it were to succeed, uh, that would change the equation greatly. Now, I, I, I believe myself that it's better to have distri distributed energy generation uh, rather than one central plant that supplies uh, a large area. But uh, uh, there are now even private companies investing in, in fusion and uh, new ideas about using, instead of trying to fuse tritium and uh, deuterium, try to fuse boron. And uh, you reduce the production of neutrons to basically nothing. Uh, with, the, <coughs> with the classical scheme, you make neutrons which will irradiate the material that uh, you have around the tokamak or whatever you use. And you get generate as much radioactivity as a fission plant. So uh, maybe there, maybe mankind will be lucky and there will be a breakthrough. It, it cannot be excluded. We're counting on you. I'm not working on that. No, but we're counting on you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Hello, uh, I'm Ville Hedberg from Carlfeldt Gymnasiet in Avesta, and I have a question for mainly Professor Feringa. Uh, I wonder, uh, what does the process look like and what kind of tools are used when uh, making a nanocar, for example? What tools are used? Y yes, and yes. what the process yeah, looks like. Yeah, yeah, we do chemical synthesis. And in chemical synthesis, what you do, you take small molecules, yeah, you change them, you make bigger molecules, for instance. And how do you do that? Because you have chemical reactions that you can break bonds and make bonds. And these are the techniques of chemical synthesis. So when you have, for instance, ethanol, yeah, you can take away the OH of ethanol and put in an amine, an NH2. Then you have ethylamine that will react with CO2, yeah, like Professor Yagi showed. You have a complete different function. So we break bonds, we make bonds, we put in molecules, different structures, etc. This is how you did it. Uh, to build such a, a structure like a nanocar, it needs many, many synthetic steps. Compare it to making a pharmaceutical, a new medicine. Often when you have a bit of a complex medicine, they have to do 15 steps or so. Yeah? Breaking bonds, making bonds, making first a structure, and then all kinds of functional groups that make it a drug so that it really comes to the spot in your body where it has to do its job. Now, that is exactly the same what we do in the laboratory, chemical reactions, and we have a whole arsenal of hundreds, maybe thousands of different chemical reactions. Catalysis is really important, eh? You know, the catalyst in your body, you learned it from Professor Arnold, the enzymes. In the chemical industry, we have, of course, a whole suit of catalysts that are the motors of the chemical industry. Every chemical reaction, almost every chemical reaction is based on a catalyst that makes it possible that you can break bonds and make bonds. Now, these are the kind of tools and techniques that we use. And chemical students, they are trained in this when they do synthetic chemistry. They're learning a lot of these tools and techniques in the laboratory to make it possible that they can make a molecule. Now, that's only one part of the story because you can make a molecule but often it's not 100% selective. Eh? You get also side products and you get other things. Then you have to isolate the molecule, purify it, and then characterize it. And so when you see a picture of a laboratory, yeah, you see maybe something doing a chemical reaction, but you see all this equipment, big machines like Röntgen, yeah, and magnetic resonance and all these thing, techniques. And this is because we have to precisely characterize if the atoms are in the right yeah, order the functional groups, if not the wrong atoms are there, et cetera, et cetera. And that is often as much work as making the molecule to prove that everything is correct.
So this is the kind of techniques, etc. It's in the ad, it looks like engineering at the molecular scale. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Hugo, and I'm from Skvadens Gymnasium. And I have a specific chemistry question to Professor Furinga. So I can see how light can resonance with the electrons in a pi bond, for example, to break it, and then the configuration can change, and a pi bond can form, and then we have a switch, kind of. But I can't imagine how like a glucose molecule or similar can create like the same effect and create a rotary motion. No, but, but in your eye and when you rotate, yeah. Yeah, that is energy from the light. Eh? I showed this is light powered, like in your eye. Mm -hmm. But when you have an other reaction, like you can convert chemical compounds by catalysis. You can also convert glucose. Yeah, that's what you mentioned, no? Yeah, but, but you had this submarine that you yeah. said used no, what glucose. We, yeah. yeah, what we do is we, we make, we use glucose and these two enzymes that convert glucose into hydrogen peroxide and then hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water. Okay. That gives oxygen. And it's almost like a rocket, you know? So the fact that you liberate oxygen, et cetera, makes that you get a movement. So we connect chemical catalysis to something that moves due to these chemical reactions. And so the enzymes are on the submarine. In, 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 yeah, enzymes are there, yeah. And yeah. in your body, enzymes do chemical catalysis. And they make it possible that you have fuels in your body and that you can do all these kind of functions. It's all catalysis. Super, thank you. Thank you, go ahead. I have another question for Professor Faringa, and I barely pass chemistry, so if I am incorrect in some way, let me know. Um, I noticed in the diagrams you showed of the rotation in your molecules, sure. uh, when the part of the molecule rotated, other parts of the molecule moved out of the way uh, to like allow for that molecule yeah. to pass. I don't know if that's just yeah. because of the diagram, but do you ever encounter like, issues with steric hindrance or the Oh, yeah. Oh, of course, this is a great question because, you know, you rotate eh, like this. Eh? This is the axis here, eh, my fingers. And you put in, normally it doesn't rotate, you put energy from the light, it starts rotating. But then these two halves have to pass each other. And this is exactly what we do to make it faster or slower. Because if it's like this, you see it hits each other, it's slow, eh? Mm -hmm. Slow. But if you make it like this, it goes very fast. This is how we do it. So you have to manipulate it? Yeah, we have to engineer the molecules to make it fast. And this is, of course, what happens in your body also, where the enzymes engineer these molecules. They can things precisely make so that things are faster or slower. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Annabelle Jerry, and I'm from Donner Gymnasium. And I have a question for you, Rafael Domjan. Uh, do you have any personal stories of people changing their like, view of solar energy or their lifestyle based on your travels? Uh, this is a very good question. There is a, uh, first of all, there is a big change from the start. When I start to do this type of project in 2004 and today, there is a big change. For example, in 2004, it was impossible just to buy an electric car. Today, I think probably in this room, there is few people who drive a Tesla or an electric car. So there is a big, big change. First of all, about the climate change. In 2004, it was year yeah, after yes, climate change, yeah, we don't care. And uh, of course, uh, uh, today, uh, this is the biggest change because the people, they saw that they can make, you said they can save money. I think today we are a step more. Ah, we can make business with solar energy. You know, for example, we work with some uh, bank who think that maybe it's better to put some money into solar energy to make big solar generator than to continue with fossil fuel. Uh, and I think this is a big difference, but this is very, maybe the last two or three years, the change about this, uh, this spirit uh, with solar energy. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Elena Larsson, and uh, I'm from Jämtlands Gymnasium Varientin in Östersund. <clears throat> and my friend asked this question that I would also like to hear the answer of. Uh, so. <laughs> It's supposed to be possible to uh, give the entire world's uh, energy need um, by solar energy, but is there enough material to make all these uh, solar panels needed? 
So this question is for anyone who would like to answer. Who wants to start? Do you like to start, Joseph? Yeah, I can say something about this. Um, there is certainly enough silicon. That's uh, one of the most abundant uh, elements uh, available. And uh, uh, it is likely that if uh, singlet fission, for example, works, that uh, the way it will be used is to take pretty much the existing silicon technology, although you could also use perovskites and uh, other materials, but I think silicon is most likely because 97 or something percent of today's solar cells are based on silicon. That technology has a great background. So, uh, and then on top of this, put a layer that has the singlet fission capability, and then allow the uh, excitation, the, the two triplets that are generated, to diffuse to the surface of the silicon and by one or another mechanism, which I don't think we need to go into, generate holes in the silicon and electrons in the silicon where an excitation dissociates spontaneously. And uh, <laughs> the layer that it would be needed it is, uh, could be a compound that may not be all that cheap. I listed a few that are actually quite cheap, but uh, it might end up being expensive. But that layer is so thin. You know, we're talking about maybe one or 200 nanometers. That the amount of material um, would uh, be almost negligible in the, in the total cost. So uh, this is not likely to be a problem. Even, uh, for example, the uh, uh, disensitized solar cells, the Gretzel cells, which are now available um, and are actually sold in, in places like Africa, uh, they are nice in that they are not rigid. You can, they are like cloth, you can change the shape, you can put them on your clothing if you want to. Um, those use um, very precious metal called ruthenium. And uh, that's an expensive metal, but the amounts used are so small that they are basically negligible relative to the rest of the production. So I think that the issue will not be a shortage of materials. The issues may be others. You know, perovskites, for example, look very promising, except that today they all contain, the good ones all contain lead. And lead, you know, we used to have it in gasoline. We got rid of it because we realized that it's not good for children that live not right next to a highway and so on. So there are issues like this that may be more essential than the shortage of material of the elements. Do either, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just we, the goal is not to do, to power the whole world only with solar energy because for example, if you go to the north of Canada in winter, you have for, you know, two months without light. So the goal is really to have a mix of energy, solar energy, the wind, uh, to find new type of en renewable energies. Uh, and if we put all this energy together, this is, I think, the way that we have to, to go. Can I, can I add sure. a comment to this? I, I'm not fully agreeing with, uh, with what has been said here. Of course, for some things, there might not be a scarcity because you use small amounts. But realize, I showed you the periodic table, and it was mentioned the ruthenium. Some of the metals are indeed pretty scarce, and there's a lot used in turbines, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, smartphones, in electric cells, in uh, batteries, etc., electric cars. I, I learned that several million yeah, smartphones are every year in Europe getting obsolete. So I think it's our duty to recover those precious metals. Even if it's not scarce, we should learn how to recover, to recycle materials. I think it is a big, big challenge. And of course, in nature, <coughs> I showed in your body, a lot of the material recycled. We hardly recycle anything. Yeah, a bit of plastic and paper. But we should learn, this is a big challenge for industry also, to learn how to recycle materials. And I think we own that to the world. 
And we are simply at the moment not smart enough. We need you to help us to, to develop that in the future. Because I think we own it to the world. Learning how not only to make things, but also to recycle things. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, I'm Emily Halmberg from Obo Academy University in Finland. And my question would be directed to Professor Mitchell. Um, and I was wondering that if you actually create this, um, this singlet fission uh, material and you make it like just be able to do the things you want to, would you be able to apply um, Professor Feringa's nanotech onto it so that it cleans itself? Or would it like, um, would it affect the efficiency of the solar panel? Well, that's an interesting thought. I think in some countries you probably would want to have something like this. Yes. Um, if, whether it would be exactly that uh, structure, I don't know. No, but no, no. the principle... Uh, the motors are way too expensive, you know. The, mm. but, but once you know how to make responsive yeah. materials, and this is what people do now, yeah. Yeah, you know the principles, you can think about sand, dust that goes off. And people do serious attempts to, to make these kind of coatings, you know. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, with, as with all technology, maybe it will take 10 years or so before it can get really uh, applied because it's cheap enough. But this is really important for all kinds of applications that you have these responsive services. And people think seriously about this uh, self, uh, re uh, how do you call it? Uh, self cleaning. Self cleaning solar panels and so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Patrick Johansson uh, from Nasiet Hudinga. Um, uh, this question is primarily to Mitchell, but uh, I think uh, you all can answer it as well. Um, uh, in your speech, uh, you talked about a lot about solar power and uh, fusion, but do you think that we'll discover something that's better than solar power but isn't fusion, and why? <coughs> I'm sorry, I didn't so understand. He's wondering if we'll find something better than solar power, um, and... What and why, basically, right? Yeah, that isn't fusion, then. Yeah. I think that uh, in the long run, uh, we will end up relying on solar power because it, of the numbers that I gave you. There is so much more of it available than all the rest put together, you know, order, order of magnitude. And uh, um, it is... Uh, you could say if fusion turns out to work, uh, perhaps that will make a difference. But the others uh, are available in limited amounts. I think we should certainly not neglect them, just like we should uh, uh, put emphasis on energy efficiency, on uh, saving energy, <coughs> not, not wasting it. But that's that's an element that was actually not included in in my talk, but I think that's something that everybody knows. If you do not waste, you don't have to produce so much. And uh, already today, much of the even domestic appliances that uh, we all use have in our houses are much better in their efficiency, they waste much less electrical energy. And this trend, I think, needs to continue. That's a very important thing. So that, uh, I think, is, is a factor that has not been mentioned yet, but it's very important. Um, I think that uh, my expectation would be that we'll end up depending on solar to a large degree. Would either of you like to add to that? or? I am fully agree with, uh, with I also, our two point I also. of view, but also the cost. Now, if you follow the cost of this technology of solar energy, is so low that I don't know which energy can be uh, cheaper than solar energy. And uh, you know, in this world, as we want to produce as a maximum as we can, it means that we have to be cheap. So if you have a cheap energy, why we have to uh, produce a, another one that is more expensive? 
<laughs> so for me, solar energy will be the, the one. I see. Thank you for all your all speeches, and thank you. Thank you. We'll take these last two questions. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is <coughs> I attend a high school nearby, and my question is for Rafael Domjani. And uh, I'm re really impressed of your flying around the world and with the boat as well. But the real question is, like, could you apply it to a bigger scale? As we all know, like, flying is a big part of uh, a lot of the CO2 emissions because it looks like the ratio between the wings and with all the solar panels and what you can actually carry is really big. So is there a real possibility that we could actually make like passenger planes uh, in, by so solar energy? Very good questions. Just about the boat. I think for the boat it's, it's possible to make this. Uh, at least electric boat and also solar boat depending on the size of course because when the size starts to, 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 to really increase the, 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 the surface that you have for the, for the volume of the boat is uh, really decreasing. So then when it's too big, you don't have enough power. This is clear. Uh, but electric, yes, of course. About uh, aircraft, I think that you will have the chance to fly in an electric aircraft in the next 15 years. That will be possible to make a, a flight from Stockholm to Oslo, for example, uh, with an electric aircraft. Not really solar, because if you want to put solar, then the density of energy is so, is so low that I think it will be more that the roof of the, of the airport will be with solar energy and you will make energy for the plane or hydrogen, for example, uh, because we didn't speak about hydrogen, but it's, uh, the hydrogen is really the future for me of, uh, of energy. It's six times more energy than with the fuel. So I think that it will be possible for you, uh, even maybe for us, to fly with an electric aircraft, maybe not solar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Lothar and I'm from Victor Dredbe Gymnasium. And I would, all of you inspired uh, hope for the future, but I would be honored if you could elaborate on this more philosophical question. Uh, do, you ever, do you ever have doubt in the future technolo technological advancements? Because they, they will happen no matter what we want, but do you think we forget uh, important things from the past? For instance, the examples of smartphones is very clear. We more now have a different social norms, or we, we act between each. Do you think we forget the importance of the past when we move into the future with all these technological advancements? So you're saying that there's a, a social cost of some of these te technological advances. You're asking if there is. Yeah, if you ever have a doubt in the tec technology. As we advance technologically, yeah. do you feel there's a large social cost that if goes I along with your it? Point, you, you cope at the white. You know, the world of today is really going just with the technology, telecommunication, always faster, and uh, this is true. But uh, in my point of view, in my, uh, why I am involved uh, to promote solar energy is because we are now so close of the, mm. you know, the problem, it's even at the door. Maybe it's too late. It means that today uh, we have to change and to stop to put this CO2 into the atmosphere. And for this, if we have to go very fast. So for me, uh, with this problem, we have to go fast and to use the technologies. But it's true that for the world of tomorrow, uh, we, that will not be uh, probably my job, but we have to think a little bit more uh, what we are doing and where we go. Uh, we have to... I don't know if we go to the good direction with, with our planet. This is... I am fully agree with you. And would you like... I, uh, I I think, uh, uh, as was mentioned during these two days, it's extremely important, the stewardship for the, our Earth, eh? that we preserve things. On the other hand, if we are much better in technology, like, for instance, energy was mentioned a lot, uh, water technology was uh, mentioned, uh, other kinds, the use of materials, yeah? computing, all these things, better pharmaceuticals. Yeah? lower energy costs, lower materials costs. If we can come up with these kind of solutions, it will help us a lot, in my opinion, yeah, to solve some of 
the pressing problems that we have with the amount of materials that we need now because we waste a lot. Yeah? I mentioned recycling of materials, but precision technology can help us a lot, both in getting food, agriculture, yeah? but also the materials, uh, the, the cars or the transport of the future, etc. So I'm, I'm a strong believer in that if we get better technologies, smarter technologies, that we can preserve a lot more in nature. Well, and, and you can also say, yeah, maybe we should have half the population in the world. But that's not so easy eh, to tell. Who should then disappear, you or me? Eh? That's, that's a difficult question. On the other hand, of course, it's also a lot about ethical and, and, and yeah, other aspects. Eh? So if you have looked now at electronics, yeah, I mentioned, uh, I think in my talk, maybe I showed, to integrate computers and chips with your brain. In the future, now we don't maybe not know enough about the brain, but if we know a lot more about neurobiology and about the brain function, they will integrate chips in your brain. Now we get an interesting discussion. If you have problems with walking when you are old or you don't memorize, maybe it's nice to have a chip eh, that helps you. But would you like to have an integrated system of a robotic and a human being? Do we want that? Can somebody zap you? Yeah, when you have a chip in your brain or download you on the internet? <laughs> I don't know. I think this is also something that is a bit scaring. Eh? We heard about DNA technology. Yeah, you can maybe, this, is, this was this big discussion last year about cloning and about all this eh? DNA modification. So there is also some aspects that go far beyond energy that we have to discuss. Do we really want that? This kind of technology? I think this is a really important question. We can discuss about this the, last, the rest of the evening, I think. Yeah, but what, yeah, what you say, Ben, is very important. The, the mankind thinks since many years now yeah. that when there is a problem, the technology will solve it. No, no, we have One day, it will not be possible anymore. No, we have to think this about what do we want to solve and what we don't, don't want. Yeah? Uh, Professor Mitchell, do you want to s add to that? Or? I, I would uh, perhaps comment that, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, the uh, social sciences and humanities deserve as much attention as uh, natural sciences and technology. Mm -hmm. I think that we cannot <coughs> just have one and without the other. Agreed. I would also say that uh, people have a tendency to idealize the past mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, before various technologies that we now consider standard existed, life was much harder. You can think of medicine as an example. You know, it's only what, 200 years that people have known about anesthesia. Before that, the doctor would saw off your limb, perhaps give you some gin or whiskey to <laughs> make it a little bit less unpleasant. Uh, much of what we now consider normal did not exist, and life was much harder. The, uh, you know, the bulk of the population, but frequently also the, uh, the rich ones, suffered from uh, infections, uh, diseases that we now don't even think about. So uh, the return to the past, you know, each one of us thinks that things used to be better, were mostly before because we were simply younger. <coughs> And we could do things that we like to do, maybe twice a day, and now we can not hardly do them at all, or maybe once a week. So uh, I think this tendency is something we need to be aware of. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you to our speakers and to the audience. And um, if I paraphrase Max Planck, um, Scientific, great scientific breakthroughs ra rarely happen overnight. What happens instead is that opponents fade away or die out or whatever. <laughs> and what I've seen in these last two days is that um, all of you have been very receptive to the wonderful talks given by all of our speakers. And I think that we're seeing um, that there's great promise ahead. So I want to thank you all for making this such a fantastic program, thanking our speakers, and uh, now we'll hear a few words from Bent Norden. Thank you. <clears throat>